Hello the world, hello the internet, hello Jason Isaacs, hello people who've just tuned in to hear my new theme music. It's good, isn't it? Once again, I'm massively indebted to Oscar, my son, who came up with this all by himself. I certainly couldn't do it. Anyway, today we're going to look at the way in which Parliament struggles to do its job. Now, on one level, that's a ridiculous question because, you know, here are its jobs. And we can ask ourselves, does it do it? Does Parliament legitimise government? Yes, of course it does. Challenges government? Yeah. Creates legislation, represent constituents? All of those things it does. That's a given. The question is, how well does it do those jobs? How well does it legitimise government, challenge government, create legislation, represent all of that sort of stuff? And the answer when we do a deep dig into all of this is actually not that well because Parliament is neither independent nor neutral. And as a result of that, um, it's clear to see, I think, that Parliament does not fulfil its jobs as well as it could do. Um, it doesn't just do its job as well as it could or as well as it should, largely because of bias and partnership and, not, and also because of structural problems. And that's where we're going to go uh, with this particular with this particular presentation, even. But let's start at the beginning with legitimising government. Does Parliament legitimise government? Well, yes, because these are the rules of parliamentary government. And the best way we can see that is when we have a change of leadership. When we have a change of leadership and we move from Blair to Brown or we move from Cameron to May, the government remains solid. Why does the government remain solid? Because Parliament continues to support it. So we don't have a collapse of government simply because the actual figurehead or the man right at the very top has gone. So even where, where, Blair, where, where Blair resigned, when Cameron resigned, the government did not collapse because it was legitimised by Parliament. It still had the confidence of Parliament. Government was able to remain intact even while the senior executive was changed. So does Parliament support government? Yes, it does. The problem is perhaps that that support is very, very rarely, rarely even withdrawn. And of course, today I'm coming at you in December 2018, uh, when perhaps we are about to see that change dramatically. But we have seen, uh, and we'll look at this in a way, we'll, 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 we have seen government act in a way that is quite appalling, that is really quite rude. And Parliament has continued to legitimise it through hell and high water. Of course, this week, all of that has been challenged, uh, but we'll come to that, I think, later. Digging into the particular detail, does government challenge, uh, does Parliament challenge government? Well, yes, it does. And here is how it does it. These are the main ways in which government challenges is challenged, sorry, by Parliament. Select committees, question, blah, 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 blah. And again, this is part of the rules of parliamentary government. If you're going to have a parliamentary government, then it has to submit itself to the oversight of government. And we can see that being made uh, evident here with Brexit uh, Select Committee demanding the impact papers. We'll come back to that. Remember that one later. Uh, and also making a hash of it. One of my favorite select committee reports, Breaking the Cycle and the Right Reform reports. Now, all of those were very, very high quality reports that were very, very critical of the government. The problem is, of course, that we have what's known as a pattern of contempt. And this is beautifully explored in this particular article here, which I'm going to link off to in the back. I'm not going to go there right now uh, because it will probably screw up the recording process. But I'll link off to that and I highly recommend that you read that because what it does is that it, re it, uh, it goes through the way in which government sometimes rejects the criticism of Parliament. And here we have three particular examples. Uh, from these select committee reports that I mentioned here and the way in which these very, very, very good impartial uh, reports were essentially ignored uh, by the government or in the case of making a hash of it, the, we had lip service paid to it with the reclassification of crystal meth. Uh, that was before Breaking Bad, so they were ahead of the curve. Well done. Um, then, of course, we've got that whole thing now uh, with the government being charged with contempt. We've had real a challenge to government that is actually moving through the mechanisms that it's no longer just challenging a particular policy it's actually starting to undermine the whole legitimacy of government and extraordinary times to be studying politics uh, but here we are seeing um, things that have never happened before never in a million never in 400 years has government been found in contempt of parliament and what we're seeing here is a small challenge to government policy is actually serving eventually through various machinations, through various echo chambers, to be amplified to the point where it's challenging the very legitimacy of government. Uh, so here um, we are seeing challenging government policy moving into challenging the legitimacy of government, uh, which I didn't expect to see uh, anytime soon. Uh, and yet here we are.
Now, again, does uh, does Parliament create legislation? Oh, yes, it does. Uh, Parliament creates law at a prodigious rate. And here is a very, very good example uh, of that. And uh, there's another tremendous report by Sweet and Maxwell, which I will link off to in the uh, at the back of this. Uh, but Parliament does create a huge amount of legislation, and some of it is really good. And uh, I pick on these two because um, I really like them. You could also pick the Health and Social Care Act, which I know a lot of students are keen to do because it demonstrates the way in which uh, the House of Commons can take on board the criticism of the House of Lords and uh, produce a compromise document that's really quite good. The flip side, of course, is that it's very rare for Parliament not to give government the law it wants. And here are three examples of notoriously bad law, uh, one of which was later struck down in the courts. That's this one here. Uh, this one's still in situ, and the Ripper has just been expanded and expanded and eventually replaced and overwhelmed by more powerful bits of legislation. But that's the one that I always remember. So again, can the government uh, get the law it wants from Parliament? Yes, it can. Sometimes that can be a good thing. Sometimes it's a less good thing. In terms of representing constituents, again, we have the Parliament uh, here suffering from being a a, a, a servant of two masters. Uh, representative democracy says that they have to account for themselves. Each MP has to account for themselves before the constituents. And we see that with Tim Yeo, who was deselected uh, back in 2015 and uh, 32 conservative rebels uh, over HS2 now obviously if you have followed my notes you'll know this is a bit more complicated uh, but it works in the context of this particular uh, idea uh, and it does serve to show the way in which some MPs can sometimes rebel against the whip now the problem we have is that uh, the election the this whole question of representation uh, the outcome of any electoral vote is a blunt uh, tool of assessment because there you have to compromise or consider sorry, both national and local outcomes. So you may find yourself in a position whereby you really, really like your local MP, but he is of a party that you can't really see doing anything in government or you really, really want uh, this government to win, but you think your local MP is about as useful as a chair. I mean, who do you vote for then? Uh, and that's very, very complicated. So when it comes to representing constituents, MPs um, do a, well, sometimes they do a good job and sometimes they do a bad job, largely because the electoral system is a tricky uh, tool of accountability. And as we go on, we start to see this one particularly here. This is really, really important that while the, the, the constituents determine who wins a particular election, who gets to stand in that particular election and what happens to them after that election is not within the gift of the uh, constituents, but rather within the gift of the party managers and so we have a massive conflict of interest there and there's a very very good example of that the Olympic the Lib Dems campaigned on a um, on a manifesto that committed not to increase tuition fees but once they found themselves in the coalition government after 2010 they were obliged by the terms of that deal to vote for tuition fees going back on all those electoral promises and uh, 27 uh, sucked it up and voted for it but 21 uh, rebelled uh, against it so in terms of representing constituents, sometimes MPs do a good job, sometimes they do a bad job. And again, matters of national interest, representative democracy, MP can debate any issue it chooses, including all of these. Uh, debates rarely, if ever, however, change parliament, change, uh, change public policy. And as that wonderful article from the government demonstrates, the Conservatives have actually been ducking uh, all opposition day motions for fear of losing the debate. I wish I'd read that before I put this uh, whole article up. So Conservatives have been ducking Opposition Day motions, uh, which is really, really interesting and really just demonstrates the contempt in which they hold Parliament. But Parliament, again, can and does debate national methods, uh, issues of national interest. Now, when it comes to supplying ministers, parliamentary government again demands that all government ministers come from Parliament. And we can see here perhaps the letter, if not the spirit of the law, being a, being recognised uh, with Miliband and Ed Balls. And a more recent example from the Conservative bench of Damien Hines, who was a SPAD, and he got parachuted in to a safe seat and uh, very, very quickly uh, elevated into various ministerial positions. So that's the government obeying the letter of the law, but not the uh, not the spirit. And again, an interesting way of contrasting this is with the United States, where cabinet level positions have to be signed off by the Senate through the position through the doctrine of advice and consent. So again, useful uh, issue there in terms of contrasting what happens in America, what happens in uh, the UK, 
Uh, hopefully that's going to make things clearer. But when it comes to supplying ministers, Parliament, again, does a good job on one hand. On the other hand, it does a pretty lousy job. So why is it? What is it that's going on here? What is it that explains the fact that Parliament kind of does half a job well and half a job badly? And the answer to that is twofold. It's the institutional imbalance and the compliant majority. Now, those of you who've been reading ahead may have heard me come talk about the parliamentary bypass. Uh, for the sake of this game, I have rolled the parliamentary bypass into the institutional imbalance purely for simplicity. Uh, uh, but hopefully it will be all very, very clear. So what I need to do now is explain the institutional imbalance and the compliant majority because these are two Floydisms. They're not quite in public parlance yet. Maybe they will be after this uh, after this uh, after this video goes viral, likely <laughs> as if. Uh, but uh, if you ever use these in the uh, essay, you need to explain what they are. So the compliant majority is the way in which the government can rely upon Parliament to vote the way it wants it to. It will normally have more than 50% of the seats by virtue of our peculiar electoral system. And the incredible strict discipline that uh, parties have means that that majority becomes compliant, hence compliant majority. And so whenever a government has a vote in Parliament, if it really wants to, it can pretty much dictate the way that that is going to come out. The institutional imbalance are a series of mechanisms in Parliament and government that mean that whenever it comes down to it, government always seems to be overpowered uh, relative to uh, Parliament. Now, let's explain what that means. In terms of legitimising government, uh, the institutional imbalance means that if we have a vote of no confidence, then the chances are that the MP will find themselves voting for, uh, fighting for a seat that they may or may not win. Therefore, they have a vested interest in not having a vote of confidence. Similarly, there's a, on the other hand, we have this compliant majority, which means that the government is likely to have the majority of MPs and they aren't going to risk their career by voting against their own government. So again, in both of these instances of legitimising government, the institutional imbalance and the compliant majority means that Parliament does not do its job in independently or neutrally. In terms of challenging government, government is the policy sovereign while legal sovereignty resides with parliament. That means that whenever parliament is challenging government, it is bringing a legal sovereignty position to bear on a policy sovereignty decision. And that doesn't work. If you're challenging government policy and all you've got is legal sovereignty, then you can't force them to change. Hence, no matter what comes out of committees, debates and select committees, it's impossible to force government to change its position unless of course you're going to go the whole hog and say well actually if you don't do this then we are going to pull the temple down on everybody's heads and that's where we are right now specific examples of that government ministers may choose not to appear before select committees they're supposed to but gordon brown never did when he was chancellor because he was always too busy select committees are dramatically understaffed for their role think about the size of the select committee on health uh, against the health department or the education select committee against education and the powers of the royal prerogative are, under, are not subject to direct challenge uh, i touch upon that later because obviously they've been rolled in and the compliant majority says that things like question time uh, diminish into constitute into political theatre. Uh, but really, the issue here with challenging government is all about this one. The reason that's relevant is because when it comes to creating legislation, it's the compliant majority that's the issue. And every time there's a vote, the government will have a majority. And so it's always going to be able to get the vote it wants. Well, most of the time, it's going to be able to get the vote it wants. The other issue thing, the other things that come here are the institutional imbalance to do with the schedule, control of the timetable. So, you know, public mem private members' bills don't get on. The parliament well that's an institutional imbalance because that means that the government can effectively tr uh, trump the uh, objections to the house of lords and statutory instruments they can just drown everybody in volume in terms of representing constituents where we kind of touched that already institutional imbalance and the compliant majority or rather this is the cause of the whole compliant majority because we have a, this position where the whereby these guys are servants of two masters debating matters of national interest again see challenging government and if it really does matter out come the whips. This is again policy debates uh, amongst the body that is legally sovereign, with the exception, of course, of your uh, confidence motions. And uh, we know how frequently they come around. Supplying ministers, again, this whole issue here of advice and consent relative to the uh, the Senate. Uh, Parliament can do nothing to object uh, to ministerial positions apart from screaming, screaming, screaming and threatening to pull the temple down on everybody's heads. And I've gone through that at a tremendous rate because I really want to get through to this bit where we've seen reigning in the royal prerogative military action. Uh, again, I'm not going to go back on this, but Syria in 2018 rather problematic. But this one really does matter. Uh, and of course, we've all got the whole Brexit thing whereby the argument from the Supreme Court was, if you went in by law, you've got to come out by law. And I'm out of time. Like and subscribe. And here's my theme music again. See you soon.